Greetings. This is being recorded on the morning of May 17th. I was intending to talk about a totally different topic, but given the crisis in Israel and Palestine, uh, Gaza, etc., I thought I would grasp this main and tragic issue and talk a little about it. I'm well aware of the fact that talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is for most people touching the third rail. No matter what you say, somebody is upset about it because people have strong views. But let me try to sort of outline what has transpired and where we are right now and do a little analysis. You've no doubt read quite a bit as well. Uh, so let me start. Uh, I think the first thing to be said, and I think for those of you who read Thomas Friedman's recent article, is that all the parties to this conflict are weak. Uh, the West Bank is weak. Abbas is weak. He canceled an election. Uh, Netanyahu is weak. Uh, or at least till this started. Uh, he, uh, for practical purposes, might have had to step down as a coalition government was formed. And Hamas, in many ways, is also on the rails. They may be well armed, but there are all kinds of difficulties in the situation in Gaza is getting very bad. So all parties to the conflict are weak in one way or the other, and therefore this conflict helps them look strong. Uh, Netanyahu, uh, who was going to be having to tread water as a, co a coalition government without him, was being formed. The president of Israel had um, told the parties that they should try to form a government. Um, in a situation like this, uh, Netanyahu, who is still in power until some other government takes over or that's until he's convicted of the various criminal proceedings against him, says to himself, this is a good time in a crisis to show strength to show how powerful I am, how decisive I am, how uh, I am, you know, not some kind of ninny uh, calling for negotiations or anything. I will put the total might of the Israeli government in the service of dealing with Hamas, which everybody agrees is a terrorist organization uh, running Gaza. So Netanyahu has something to prove here. And he has gone on television uh, consistently saying that, you know, we're going to be tough here. Um, and so what you're dealing with is all sides being weak in one way or another, trying to throw, show, you know, their manhood, their power, their capacity, their arms and so forth. That to begin with is a very dangerous situation. You don't want actors to act out of weakness to show how strong and powerful they are. That's the first thing to be said. The second thing is that uh, the unraveling of the situation in Israel with respect to the Palestinians before you ever get to Hamas and Gaza uh, started um, actually sort of in April, uh, which is sort of the beginning of Ramadan for Muslims and the uh, Aqsa Mosque. Uh, was getting, you know, prepared for the celebrations and so forth. And the Israeli government marched people into the mask, I think it was April 13th, and disconnected all the loudspeakers in the mosque. And they disconnected them because uh, the Israelis were also holding memorial service not so far away, and they didn't want to have to be, uh, you know, listening to loudspeakers from the mask. Mosque. Uh, this may seem like a very minor incident, but it's a slap in the face of Israeli Arabs, as they're called, 
uh, who were getting ready for their biggest celebrations and holy holidays. Uh, and who, even though the mosque is obviously a Muslim uh, place, uh, were being told, you know, you're in Israel and the Israelis can march in and disconnect your, your, um, your loudspeakers. The second thing that transpired in East Jerusalem was something which is also of long-standing conflict within Israel and therefore a cause celebre for Hamas and people on the West Bank, uh, which is that um, people in East Jerusalem, some families in East Jerusalem, Arab families in East Jerusalem, were being uh, told that they had to leave their apartments because Israeli settlers were going to move in. And the justification of the Israeli settlers was that once upon a time, uh, Israelis lived in those apartments. This, by the way, sets up an interesting dynamic. For any place in Israel where Jews ever lived, Jews are entitled to those places, whether it's land or buildings, and it doesn't matter whether the people on the land or in the buildings are Israeli um, Arabs. And uh, this caused something of an uproar. And of course, what we in the American press read less about is that any place that used to be an apartment or a piece of land that belonged to the Palestinians, Israeli Jews are entitled to take it over. So here you can see an inequity. That is to say, Jews can claim any part of Israel, any apartment, any house, any land and because it's Israel and it's a Jewish state. And Palestinians, on the other hand, have to vacate any time uh, a Jewish settler decides that they want to live in a particular place or start a settlement. Uh, this does not get go down well with the Israeli um, Arab population. So this was happening. And the combination of the situation in the mosque and the possible takeover of the apartments started some street demonstrations, especially amongst young Arabs, but they were fairly peaceful. Uh, then you get to the end of Ramadan. And before the end of Ramadan, the Israeli government put fencing around the mosque. And uh, that made it even uh, more explosive for the Arabs there. And you saw fairly large demonstrations. Those demonstrations were put down with serious force by Netanyahu showing how tough he is and how the Israeli government will put down any trouble. And as this was going on, Hamas saw an opportunity in Gaza to, to try to help the Arabs in Israel and to get themselves involved. So this started unraveling, you know, fairly, fairly uh, slowly, step by step. At the end of the day, you have Hamas getting involved within Israel with its security forces, and you have Israel beginning to respond to Hamas, but of course responding in, in, in Gaza. Um, there are some sort of other analysis that can be made of the situation, which is that heretofore, when Hamas, you know, reared, reared its head, whether it was 2014 or before, uh, the Israeli Jewish population on the side jumped uh, to support the government, right-wing government, centrist government, whatever government. Uh, this didn't quite happen this time. That is to say, there are any number of, we would call them progressive Jews in Israel, who feel that the Netanyahu government, which is a very right-wing government, has been doing the wrong thing, has it been exacerbating things, and has, in, a, in many ways, mistreated the Israeli Arabs, even as, um, you know, in the current, in the current situation. Now here you have a few interesting things, uh, many of you may know, about 20% of the Israeli population are quote unquote Arab Israelis. Uh, they have some citizenship standing, but not totally. Uh, and they have been uh, feeling for years that they're discriminated against. 
And all of a sudden in uh, the elections that were held in the, in the spring, that in a sense looked like they were dethroning Netanyahu, the various other parties were having discussions with the Israeli Arabs to bring an Israeli Arab party into a coalition. And that was an entirely new development and an interesting development because it gave the Israeli Arabs hope that they could be in, you know, a multi-religious, multi-ethnic, whatever state. And for the first time were invited, at least in discussions, in terms of formulating a coalition uh, government. Uh, they were being invited to participate. This was a new environment and it, a new development and internationally was considered quite, quite hopeful. That of course is in Schmidarines right now, but I just wanna bring that up to date. The other thing that you might notice is that the Palestinians in Israel are always referred to as Israeli Arabs rather than Palestinians. That's an, sort of an interesting, interesting sideline. So, when this conflict started escalating around the mosque and around demonstrations, you have relatively violent demonstrations in East Jerusalem against the actions of the Israeli government and a huge and heavy handed response by the Israeli government, which Netanyahu said with great pride, we are tough, we're going to put these people down, kill a few, that's okay, injure lots of people, but we're going to show with the Israeli government and we won't have any of this. This, of course, ignited support by the Arab Israelis who were trying to see whether they could not work and develop a co and participate in a co coalition government. The other thing that's of interest is that heretofore, up until now, generally speaking, when there were conflict with Gaza and Hamas, the Israeli population seemed fairly uniformly in support of the government and doing something about Hamas and, the ter and its terrorist uh, organization. That's not apparently quite as true this time. That is to say progressive Israelis or liberal Israelis or non-settler Israelis um, are uh, criticizing, their, <laughs> criticizing their own government at this point. So you have a kind of an interesting dynamic that is changing. On the one hand, of course, Israelis are very upset at the missiles that are being launched against them. And there have been, what, maybe 10 Israeli deaths, one or two children, great tragedy. And of course, the Israeli population is besides themselves in sorrow and anger about this. On the other hand, there's ongoing criticism of Netanyahu and his administration and the treatment that he has given to um, to uh, the Arabs uh, over the years, but also uh, in the current conflagration uh, that is taken that is taking taking place. So the Palestinian population is not, you know, uniformly in favor of what the government is doing. And for example, there are discussions now or urgings that both parties cease fire before things get even more out of hand and there are more killings. And the um, Netanyahu administration says, no way, we're just gonna keep bombarding um, uh, Gaza because we wanna destroy Hamas. <clears throat> and um, you know we're not gonna end it here and we don't really care how many people get killed in Gaza. Um, there's the vision in Israel about this right now. So that's an interesting aside. Now, with respect to Gaza, I don't know if any of you watching this have been to Gaza, but you know, Gaza is a nightmarish place. Uh, these people in Gaza are victimized by Hamas, but they're also victimized by the economic circumstances that well, <clears throat> excuse me, a combination of Hamas and the Israelis have provided. As you probably have read, there are 200 or more casualties in Gaza right now. Um, something like 50 children have been killed in Gaza. Uh, civilian apartment houses have been brought to the ground. 
Uh, the Israelis say that's because some Hamas people live there or some leaders live there. Uh, you might have heard yesterday that um, the uh, a big high rise building which housed most of the international press, American press, inter, you know, BBC, Al Jazeera, uh, you know, more or less all the press which had been living there for years and by the way didn't just sort of report out of there but live there there they, they had bedrooms there and so forth uh, running water and electricity even when it was not available in the rest of gaza they were given an hour's warning to get the hell out of there and so no one got none of these press people got killed on the other hand their equipment and their whole you know structural circumstances uh, was destroyed. Uh, what did Netanyahu said? Well, some Hamas people also lived in that building. So um, the, you know, Gaza is increasingly in rubble. The hospitals aren't functioning. The water system isn't operational. The electricity is not going. And outsiders, uh, as well as some insiders, they say, for heaven's sake, let's have a ceasefire before more harm is done. And Netanyahu is essentially saying, no way, we're going to keep this going for a while. Maybe we can actually destroy Hamas. Um, maybe, but unlikely story, right? Uh, terrorist organizations like Hamas are operating out of Lebanon and other places. And as long as there's no solution between the Israelis and Palestinians, whether it's two state or one state, it is very unlikely uh, that this will be sorted out by bombing uh, you know, the hell out of Gaza. And essentially uh, by any international standards uh, engaging in war crimes. Now the war crimes issue is interesting because of course both sides can be charged with war crimes. Uh, the missiles, the hundreds and hundreds of missiles that the uh, uh, Hamas is lopping into Israel, most of which, as you know, uh, get destroyed by the uh, defense structure in Israel, but some of them actually are getting through to Tel Aviv and other places. Um, that's a war crime because you're not allowed to hit or target civilian areas. And almost everything that uh, Israel is doing in Gaza is a war crime, even though they say some enemies are hidden and so forth. But most of the people getting killed are not Hamas operatives. They are, you know, men, women, children dying right and left, getting injured, thousands getting injured and so forth. So these are serious war crimes on both sides. Let me just sort of as an aside say, you may say, well, you know, where did Hamas get all these weapons from? I mean, they're lopping hundreds and even thousands of missiles into Israel. Well, they got them from all sorts of sources, not least Iran, and they uh, have been hidden in tunnels and so on. So in that sense, Israel has a point that Gaza is heavily armed by Hamas. On the other hand, of course, Israel is also heavily armed, right, as we know. And that leads me to jump to outsiders, for example, the United States. As you may or may not know, uh, the US contributes $4 billion a year in military assistance to Israel. That's the largest amount of military assistance we contribute anywhere. And the Biden administration a few weeks back, was it a month ago or something, even agreed before this conflict started, even agreed to send a few hundred thousand millions more to help the military there. So in terms of the arms capability of Israel, uh, it is largely American arms as well as Israeli technological know-how. And in terms of the arms in Gaza, uh, it is comes from Iran and other and other countries. So in some sense, it's a plague on both of your houses. That region is armed to the gills and therefore can keep killing people for weeks to come uh, because outsiders have been arming both sides. So that, you know, any ceasefire or long-term solution has to address the role of outsiders. Now, from the perspective of the United States, you might have noticed over the years that no matter what happens in the Middle East, 
the US administration, whether they're Republican or Democratic, stand up strongly and staunchly uh, for Israel. Um, and, you know, it's sometimes there are some critical discussions and negotiations, but the fact of the matter is, you know, the Israel has a right to exist. By the way, I don't think anybody is questioning that other than the, uh, uh, you know, Hamas and, and uh, some radical Islam groups in the Middle East. But everybody sort of accepts the Arab Emirates and so forth, accepts that Israel is here to stay. In fact, under Trump administration, many of those countries decided to recognize Israel and so forth. So uh, the fact that Israel has a right to exist, which also sound, always sounds very dramatic as if, if you know, most of the main major actors in the world don't think it has a right to exist is a kind of a dramatic and gesture to try to get, uh, you know, support for Israel. But it should be said that in general, one of the reasons American presidents have always supported Israel in these conflicts is that a large chunk of the political class in the United States, for example, Democrats in Congress, as well as the pop population, as well as the political parties and where they get their funds from and so forth, are dependent on the goodwill of American Jews on the one hand, and on the other hand, on the general American population, which wants to support Israel whenever it's under siege. That is slightly changing as well, and it has changed uh, under this current uh, conflict quite a bit. Uh, first of all, um, there, a fair chunk of the American Jewish population uh, were in due course, originally they were Netanyahu supported, in due course saw Netanyahu as too right wing, uh, not uh, potentially also engaging in personal criminal activity. Uh, but were wishing for a more moderate and conciliatory government in Israel. So the support of the Israeli, the particular inhabitant of the, of the prime ministership of Israel has lost support amongst American Jews as is documented in polls and so forth. It has also lost support to some extent in, in the American political class, uh, for example, um, the House of Representatives, I believe, sent a letter to Biden uh, asking, you know, that uh, the conf that the U.S. do do more to end the conflict and so on. And interestingly enough, a little wrinkle here: Mr. Demmer, who used to be the Israeli ambassador to the United States. Um, uh, recently wrote, and it's actually was in the New York Times, and I can read it to you, that um, the, uh, it, suggests in the it has suggested in the past week that Israel should focus more passionate and unequal support of evangelical Christians instead of American Jews. Now, this is a really interesting development because uh, quite a group of American Jews are not particularly supportive of the current Israeli government and believe that, you know, uh, some kind of solution of Israelis and Palestinians living together in Israel and a fairer treatment of Israeli Arabs dash Palestinians uh, would be in the interest of the state of Israel and, and Jews around the world. Evangelical Christians, however, have been very strong supporters, it's especially in the sort of extreme group of evangelical Christians, not all of them, but you know, the groups that uh, would demonstrate in front of abortion clinics and would, um, you know, uh, support with funding uh, Israeli governments and so forth, because of course the evangelical Christians who in fairly large numbers actually visit Israel, um, have an, you know, a stake in the history of Jesus Christ and all the rest of it in, in, in Israel. 
So I think it's ironic and sort of peculiar almost that a former ambassador, a strong supporter of Netanyahu should say, Israeli government, stop you know, trying to rope in American Jews in support of yourself. You should try to rope in more support, both political support and financial support from evangelical Christians in the United States. You can see by this how out of skew this has all gotten. That is to say, the, the, the dividing line of no matter what the Israeli government would do, got strong support from all American Jews, that's no longer the case, uh, that with uh, the general public, Democrats in particular, but also Republicans would support more and more military aid for whatever the Israeli government was doing, whenever there was a conflict would be supporting Israel and so forth. That has all atrophied. So I want to just make a strong point here is that we're in a new ballgame. The fact that this is a new ballgame is actually and ironically not totally visible in terms of the Biden administration, because Biden's first response to when this current conflict started, we're saying, we the United States support Israel and Israel's right to exist. Well, nobody is questioning Israel's right to exist in the United States political uh, establishment, but in any event, and uh, you know, bemoan the deaths from missiles and so forth in Israel without saying anything about what was happening to the civilian population in Gaza. Uh, since his early pronouncements, uh, he's been more even handed. But even this morning, I listened to the news conference, uh, the administration still sort of says, well, you know, uh, we want to be even handed, we want to, uh, uh, you know, negotiate carefully and so forth. And one of the reasons that the Security Council has been unable to, uh, you know, condemn what is going on as war crimes is because the American representative, of course, representing the administration, is uh, not wanting to sort of be even handed and say a plague on both your houses, you're both committing war crimes. So the US formal position right now is we want this to stop, we want to mediate, we want to draw in other countries to help mediate and so forth. But uh, this is not easy for the United States right now. And it's not easy because of the Trump administration, because the Trump administration had made quite clear that they are fully, they were fully on Netanyahu's side of things. If you recall, the American embassy was moved into Jerusalem, which to put it mildly was uh, upsetting to some portion of the Israeli population, obviously the Israeli Arabs, but also um, the, uh, you know, some of the more liberal Israelis who said, this is not a smart move right now. This is not a conciliatory move. This is not going to resolve anything. So um, the U.S. is trying to play a role. And of course, the U.S. is, um, you know, major power in the world. But it pretty much has to rely on others at this point to try to mediate it and to put some pressure on both sides. That is to say, to get our pressure put on the, on, the, um, on the folks in Gaza, uh, Hamas, and put pressure on the Israeli government to back off. So far, none of this has worked. And so far, all the statements of Netanyahu, including on the weekend, is we're going to keep at it. We're not going to uh, have a ceasefire because we're going to do more harm in Gaza and finally, you know, get rid of uh, this problem. Uh, my take on it is more deaths in Gaza, some more deaths in Israel, uh, more of Gaza will be destroyed. Life in Gaza will, is fairly unbearable under the best of circumstances will get even worse for a long time to come. And at the end of the day, uh, having this kind of conflict uh, will enhance whether it's Hamas or other terrorist organizations to say, well, you know, uh, we need help from Iran, other countries, uh, in order to rebuild and not to rebuild Gaza so much, but to rebuild our arms and to keep this uh, conflict going. So what's the best hope here? The best hope here is that not too many more people get killed. As you know, 
Many of those killed are women and children in Gaza in particular. Uh, and that, uh, you know, not too many civilian uh, establishments get destroyed and that there's going to be some international help for the Gazans, never mind Hamas, so they can have electricity and water and don't live, have to live on the streets in rubble. I mean, it, it is, you know, look at the pictures of Gaza sometime. It is a human catastrophe there. And you can say, well, all right, they brought it on themselves because they allow Hamas to operate. But, you know, most civilians in most countries don't bring these things on themselves. They become victims of political actors. And at this particular point, I would say both Israelis and uh, the Palestinians in Gaza are victims of, uh, of what, is, what is going on. A, finally, a final point I wanna make is that um, what you hadn't seen up until this recent conflict were sort of violent uprising in smaller towns in Israel where Israeli Arabs and Jews uh, were in street fights and where um, Arab Israelis were on the whole fairly peaceful. Uh, and people, it was said, people live peacefully side by side. Uh, that has now been ignited. Uh, and so now you have a situation, not just of a conflict with Gaza, but, and Hamas, wherever it's located, but you're very close to a civil war in Israel. And that is very serious and that needs to be addressed because you can't just get rid of 20% of your population, right? Even if you take away all their housing and their land and so forth. Uh, and settlers coming from the United States and elsewhere who on the whole are not sort of, you know, um, engaged Jews, but not necessarily radically religious. Uh, the, many of the settlers are fairly radically religious people who themselves make trouble for most mainstream Israelis, right? Who think of them as sort of loony religious fringes, some of them. Uh, so you don't just have the sort of settlers engaging with conflict with Israelis over land and so forth, but now you have, you know, uh, Arab youth, some well-educated leaders who have not themselves participated in conflict saying, you know, it's gone too far. We now have to fight for our benefit, for our rights. And that is particularly linked to the fact that they thought they were very close to being able to participate in the government in some kind of discussions between various parties trying to form a government uh, to uh, take over from Netanyahu. So the fact that there seemed to have been a small window for the Israeli Arabs who are not particularly, who are not Hamas or anything, who just want to continue to live there and work there and so forth, uh, a small window of hopefulness that they might be included somewhere was uh, enough for them to now fight. So it seems to me Israel in the, not only is Hamas in a difficult situation in the Gazans, but Israel is in a difficult situation because it's not just fighting Hamas and the West Bank and Gaza, but it now has a potential civil conflict on its hands inside of Israel. So the sooner that uh, political figures other than Netanyahu can get it together and can be supported, and some reasonable government in Israel can be formed, which is inclusive, inclusive in terms of right, left, and center for Israeli Jews, but also gives hope and participation of the 20% of the Arab Israeli population. Uh, the sooner that that all you know, can happen, the more likely that something more permanently can evolve that isn't just repetition of humans and civilians losing their lives and destruction. So stay tuned, this is by no means settled. It's um, much more complicated than meets the eye because you now have, as I said, two layers, the fight with Hamas, but also the potential for internal civil conflict in Israel. No Israeli and no Jew in the United States or any American who is not a Jew who wishes Israel well can be happy about the current situation. Thank you very much. See you in two weeks.